like to take a moment and thank our sponsor. If you have a laser device for training and you want to take it to the next level, or if you're looking to get into using a laser device for training, check out the products at laserapp.com. L-A-S-R-A-P-P.com. You can use code CSP2021 for 15% off the items you've selected. And thanks for checking them out. Welcome to this week's edition of the Casual Shooters Podcast. This week you have me, Dave, and you have Leo. Hello. Our guest this week is a former Marine, current law enforcement, and looking to increase his place in the world of practical shooting. Let's welcome Matthew Nash to the show. Hey, Matt. Hey, how's it going, guys? Thanks for having me. Good. Thanks for being on. Why don't you go ahead and take a second and introduce yourself? Yeah, I thought you uh, summed it up. Uh, prior Marine, so Semper Fi. I uh, love the shirt fine. you're wearing today. Thank you much. Um, I got out of the Marine Corps uh, in 2004, just after 9-11. Um, my team was a little bit involved in, in some of the early on operations after our president said, let's roll. And uh, I got out. I wanted to go to school. Um, I did protection my last year in the Marine Corps, uh, mainly to get me back overseas uh, because we had just finished our deployment and was the only thing open. And I, I kind of enjoyed it. Um, and while I was in school, Secret Service kind of put a bug in my ear about the civilian side. Um, I was going through that process. And then the Pentagon Operations or Pentagon Force Protection Agency um, kind of recruited me and has really just given me a, a, an amazing opportunity to grow in that agency. And I'm still close to the Department of Defense and the military. I work every day at the, the Pentagon. Uh, and I've had, I've never wanted to leave, you know, I, I, it's bittersweet when you get out of the Marine Corps, you miss it immediately, you know, you miss that camaraderie and the connection that I've had been able to maintain in law enforcement with DOD has just been priceless to me. And you know what they say, if, if you enjoy what you do, you never work a day in your life. And that's kind of how I've been living the American dream there. Um, we obviously just had a fallen soldier, George uh, Gonzalez. Um, so I, you know, been working with our department on kind of overcoming that recent challenge. Um, but shout out to his family. Uh, I just want to give some prayers really quick to all of them. Uh, New York took care of us well. Uh, he was buried last week. So, um, but yeah, so I, I do personal protection now for the Department of Defense. Um, I help protect the Undersecretaries of Defense as one of their key personal security advisors. I have an amazing team of agents and officers that I work with every day and that same kind of Marine Corps camaraderie. Um, and that's kind of what got me into shooting. So I don't want to kind of expand on that right now. I think we're going to talk a little bit about that. But, yeah. you know, coming out of the Marine Corps, you know, especially like yourself in some elite units, all we do is train, right? We're like professional athletes. And that's one of the things that we do a lot. And it was just unfamiliar to me in law enforcement. You don't get to train to that level. Uh, and my standards were up here. And, you know, law enforcement, unfortunately, they just have a lot to cover down on and, and very limited resources. So we just don't get that much time. So I found USPSA and competitive shooting mainly to augment my practice for my job. Um, and then the competitive side hit and the community and, and the friendships and the, the story is kind of progressing from there. Yeah. All right. All right, so Matt, we normally do a well. We we ask some personal questions to get to know our guest. I don't know if you've listened to the podcast before. Uh, if so, I, I have. Okay, Gary Aid is uh, representing pretty strong lately. Yeah, of course. Yep. All right, so we're going to start off with those five questions. What's your okay. favorite movie? Favorite movie has to be Round Rounders. Um, you know, it's a movie about a. Uh, uh, High stakes poker, just kind of a, a classic, um, kind of talks about, you know, close friends and team and then, you know, the pursuit of following your dreams in a way, um, just was a classic to me. So, yeah, it's very good. There, there's a lot of, a lot of good ones to choose from, but I, I'll go with kind of a classic there. Okay. I don't think I've ever heard of it. Oh, oh. Dave, you have to watch this. Pay that man his money. Yes, oh, man. <laughs> so good. Yeah, so good. You'll be walking chick, up chick, the stages chick, chick, chick. With, with Oreos on, on a rack saying this yeah. is going to be a stage win. <laughs> stage win. <laughs> yep. Trust me, you got to watch it. It's well, a very good I, choice. I'm intrigued now. Yeah. yeah. Favorite book? Um, so I'll give two. I, I love Simon Sinek. Um, he's on TED videos. He's an inspirational speaker. 
big on leadership coming from the Marine Corps and in law enforcement. And he wrote a book called uh, Great Eaters Eat Last. And if you aren't hooked on the beginning story he tells, which you can also watch him tell it online, um, but he talks about a Marine uh, warfighter uh, in a valley protecting Marines in a, in a war, um, um, in a, um, shoot, I just forgot the name of the aircraft, but what are their aircraft? The, uh, the Warhog or not Warhog? A-10. 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 Yep. Yep. And they're in the valleys, uh, protecting a squad. And all of a sudden they hear, you know, troops in contact and they're getting ambushed. Um, and the pilots, there's two pilots circling off. Cloud coverage is very, very low. They're using outdated maps. Um, and it's very risky. Pretty much they know if they go there and provide cover that it's not going to be easy to come back up. And it's a tight valley. So the, the one pilot, the leader of the two, says, we're going down. Um, so they go down. And the way they do it is they count. Uh, so they come down. And they, don't, they know the train's going to close in on them. So they got to get down, lay the fire, and come back up into the clouds. So the leader takes his co-pilot down. They go one, 1,000, two, 1,000. They lay down fire. And five, 1,000, they pull up and they just miss the, the mountains, right? So they do this two more times. And the lead pilot runs out of ammunition. He says, you got to get down there and provide cover. And he says, I don't think I can do it. And he says, I'll take you down. I'll count for you. Long story short, I don't, I don't want to ruin the book, but it's a great story. You got to hear Simon Sinek tells it. And he goes down and he leads his pilot. Every single Marine walked out of that valley. And if, if you kind of look at the operation and you study it, there, there should have been no way there was no casualties. And so Simon Sykes says, hey, you took your plane down there. You pretty much knew you were going to crash. Like you made a conscious choice saying we're probably not going to come out of this valley, but we're going to lay down some fire. Why did you do it? And the whole book is about that in leadership. And it, and it talks about leadership and doing something, giving all you have for others. And I can't think of a greatest, greater hook in a book, and he, and he explores that. And we all use leadership in, in our daily lives, and I think it's just very inspirational. Uh, the quick, the second book I got to talk about that's an unknown is called Tiger Trap. It's just a fascinating story. I can't believe they haven't made a movie about it yet. It's about an FBI agent in Washington, D.C. that uncovers, well, California and D.C., that uncovers a Chinese spy. Ends up having an, uh, flipping that spy to work for the United States. The spy ends up having an affair with that FBI agent, right? So a double spy now turning our FBI against us, right, to recruit. Then an FBI uh, special agent in charge finds this out and starts running an investigation on that FBI agent, but then gets hooked and has an affair with the same Chinese spy. I mean, you can't make this up, right? I mean, if this was in the movies, they're going to be like, oh, that's fake. You know, that would never happen. Um, so it's a fascinating story. It actually ties in the Pentagon because that Chinese uh, spy was a handler for some contractors in the Pentagon. Uh, some friends that I know that helped work that uh, investigation. And, and it's just, it's very fascinating. I can't believe there's not a movie on it, but it's a great read. Not fictional, but you're going to feel like it is. Uh, so it's called Tiger Trap by David Wise. Where does Eric Swallow fit in all this? I'm sorry? Where does Eric Swallow fit into all of this? Yes, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Yep. David Wise, you said? David Wise. You'll see a red cover with the dragon on it, Tiger Trap. Okay. But real quick, to go back to that first one, uh, I watched the TED Talk where he talked about that mission. It, it is extremely compelling. Yeah. So yeah. I'm now I'm going to have to read the book. Yeah, an amazing book. Um, I, I had a couple copies. I keep giving them out to people. It, I mean, it's something you can kind of keep. I'll, I'll get my own. I promise. Reading. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm going to have to stop asking this question because I think I'm up to like 47 books I have to read now. I know. I, know. I, I have like pages six, of notes. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. I know. I got to read this one. I got to read this one. Oh, <laughs> hey, good Lord. Gun racks and book racks. That's going to be your backdrop. <laughs> there you go. All right, this is uh, the Huggy special. Who Huggy is, I have no idea, but the, yeah. its favorite superhero. <laughs> you know, growing up, I liked Wolverine. I don't know why okay. as a kid. It kind of stuck. Those were the comics that were kind of in my area at the time, and he was hitting mainstream, so I'm partial to my childhood, so Wolverine. Okay. Favorite gun and caliber. Now, you can have a favorite gun – like a 1911, but your favorite caliber could be 6.5 Creedmoor. It doesn't have to be the same. That's true. 
Um, you know, probably the CZ SPO one target was still probably my favorite gun. Um, I sold that to Wampler never should have. Um, I, and you know, he actually beat me in a match when I sold that to him, but, uh, oh. he probably doesn't remember that, but, um, uh, I don't know. That's my favorite. I wish I could have it back, but you know, I run the, the shadow two right now and I love it just as much. Um, and, and nine millimeters, probably my favorite caliber, although not enjoying the pricing right now. No. Yeah. yeah. At all. Definitely not. All right, so here's the one question unique to you. Um, and I've asked this to a couple of the other military people. What was your favorite memory, duty station, or deployment while in the Marines? That's a good one. I was unprepared for that. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you think you would talk about like an operation or something, but some of my memories are just kind of like my group of friends now, just jokesters, you know, and, um, you know, I have some funny ones. Um, you know, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll censor it for this show. Probably probably my favorite memory um, was just just kind of going to Italy with a bunch of the Marines. You know, we we were uh, after nine eleven, we were on and off ships in the Mediterranean, and we were stationed on Naples, Italy, which was just an amazing experience. Um, prior to that, I went to Cuba. So it wasn't really a deployment. It was more training, but Italy was probably my first time going overseas. And, um, that's probably my favorite memory. And, and what it instilled in me, you know, is a little bit of culture and understanding that the world's much bigger than the United States. And, uh, I'm going to segue that into something that I wish USPSA would do more. And, and that is promote international matches. You know, I had the opportunity to go to uh, the Extreme Euro a couple years back with Mason Lane, Wansa Kim, and Casey Reed, um, and, and, and some others. And that was an amazing experience. Um, the camaraderie extends. The camaraderie that we know in USPSA is the same in IPSC, if not more, because they appreciate you coming over there to their country and shooting a match. And, and then getting to walk the streets, go get ice cream with those guys and, and laugh afterwards. You know, I would say it's the same, you know, just – you know, my memory in the Marine Corps is just traveling abroad and meeting different people and meeting the world. And and uh, that's something that I plan to pass down to my kids, something that I still got to get my mom to go overseas. She's never been left the United States. So I'm like, we're doing it this year. I'm going to try and take her to the world shoot to Thailand. Um, so I'm kind of disappointed it was pushed. But, yeah. Uh, I'm, all right. I, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to pause right there because I want to. I really like some of the things that I see uh, coming out of Europe on social media with their IPSC stuff. <clears throat> Can you go take a minute and just explain the differences you saw shooting extreme Euro versus even a nationals or a major over here? Yeah, absolutely. There, there was a lot. Um, and just so you guys know, I, I didn't talk about this, but I've been shooting USPSA for six years, roughly around the time I went to my first international match. Um, pretty competitively. I shoot about 15 majors a year all over the country, pretty much as, as much as my family can help me out with because it's a big time commitment, right? Um, and so I have a good knowledge. I've worked Area 8 before. By the way, I saw you had Cy and, and Van on, on the line. They're, they're throwing one of the best area matches because they're taking a lot of input for IPSC. Um, you know, not just the format, but the stage design, thinking about what skills we want to test and have a broad range of skills tested, right? Uh, but there's a lot to be said for that. And Mason Lane and I, well, mainly Mason Lane's working on a, uh, a book, but we, we had talked about that saying someone needs to put some knowledge out there to help people understand how to test skills at a high level. And we feel that's where it starts with IPSC is every stage has a purpose. You can kind of tell what they're testing. And then there's some things that will surprise you that you make the little note saying, I need to work on this. Right. They, they, they taught me, you know, they really tested me on soft exits and I didn't see that coming on this stage, but that was the key um, or something like that. You know, that's an exit where maybe you're, you're, you know, you're not just planning. You got to shoot and get out quickly. So uh, the first thing that I noticed right up front was the professionalism of the staff. Right. And, and I know I'm pretty sure their staff's not paid. Uh, but one of the things that they did do was really cool that I thought we could probably look at in USPSA is they partnered with some local youth in their region. I, and this was in check. Uh, and I don't know if they get free, you know, range uh, dues or something like that, 
but they had two or three kids on every stage and their job was to reset steel and, 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 uh, and spray paint it. And it was how they did it. They did it very, very fast. It was almost like a competition to them. Um, so the stages ran very smooth because of that, um, I noticed at one point, cause you don't pace in Europe. Um, and it's like most matches you don't pace. You just sit there. Stages are reset probably in under two minutes. Uh, I mean, and they're, you know, long bays and stuff. It's amazing. It's a well-oiled machine. Uh, and anyone that goes to a Nipsic match will first be impressed by that, how fast the stage is. And that kind of gives us that professional caliber, right? Uh, no different than an umpire brushing off the home plate before every pitch or, you know, the uh, in NFL, them wiping down the footballs and having it placed right on the line, right? It, it, it's, it's a well-oiled machine. And I noticed that the staff really takes heart to that. They, they want – not that our staff doesn't, but there's like a different culture there. There's a different breed. And I saw range masters getting on staff that I didn't even notice we were off pace. But, you know, I'm like, hey, we're running great. And next thing you know, I see him getting into him saying, hey, you're about a 30 seconds off pace. Let's pick it up before it came a problem. Right. And that's something that, um, you know, I know there are great match directors that do it, but it, it's exhausting. And we ran just to give you an idea how efficient this state match ran. We ran 10 stages in a half-day format. Good Lord. Unbelievable, right? I ran 30 stages in, in three days. I was out on the range by like 8.30, out by before 11.30. 10 stages shot. And they were not short stages, no class fire type stages. Um, they did double up some bays, and that was probably the more impressive part. The double up bays are actually the quickest bays. Um, I would say, you know, they didn't have a popper calibration issue. <laughs> well, that's because there's no wind in Europe. <laughs> yeah, they, they did have a few big poppers, but a lot of the steel they used was knockdown steel. You know, the kind of just it's kind metric. Of away. Yeah. It's because it's metric, <laughs> and you use nine millimeter, which is yeah. metric. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. <laughs> but I can tell there's also so so that's one thing the efficiency which the matches are run, uh, the staff uh, how professional they take it. Uh, which I, and then they also incorporate, you know, youth to help them out with the workload there. The, the second thing was probably the movers are much more challenging in Ipsic. I mean, we're talking over the top swingers at 30 yards. Um, you know, we're talking, there was one stage, we had three different movers. We had the zip line, we had a drop down and a swinger. And, you know, that was very challenging. So the timing sequences there, uh, they do a lot of steel over the tops um, or steel bobbers, but the movers are on another level there. And that's something for world shoot that I know I'm getting ready to work hard on, um, it, you know, is, is movers uh, because those timing stages can, can add up, you know, they're usually smaller stages, but you can bleed 10, 15 points and those start adding up quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I would say movers, the, the efficiency and how many stages they can clear in a half day or day format um, you know, they don't throw a lot of partials. They have a hidden way of making open target seem like a partial, if that makes sense. Like, you know, if you, if you have to exit on an open target at 20 yards, there's a lot of people that start bleeding deltas, right. Or they're going to stay there and bleed time. So like, they don't have to throw a lot of partials in there. Uh, so, you know, the other thing that I noticed was the weather I'm in Virginia and I hate the, the sweat and the grip. I like a good purchase. So, you know, I can chalk up like Christian sailor and look like a, like a, you know, Olympian getting ready to do a vault or something, but over, over, yeah, over there, there's, there's no humidity. So like, I was like, Hey, I don't have to use pro grip. So, uh, I think that's, you know, that company probably sells more majority of their product here in the States, but that was an, I noticed that as a shooter and Thailand I, I, I world shoots going to be, yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah. Did, did you well, ever get truck. Did you ever make it to Southeast Asia during your time in the Marines, Matt? Uh, I did not. No. Okay. I have been I... in, in the law enforcement side, but not. Okay. Yeah, I've been to the Philippines and I know it's just like Thailand and holy guacamole Batman. Yeah. Woo. On and off rain too here and there, but yeah. I'm yeah. we'll be ready Try for being it. fat. I don't yeah. want to hear it from you guys. <laughs> oh, look at me, I'm fit. Yeah. This guy suffers uh, three showers a day. <laughs> So when, when did you first start shooting guns? At what age was that? Uh, the United States Marine Corps. Um, oh, you know, wow. and 
Yeah, I had never picked up a gun. Uh, I did Boy Scouts, shot the bow. I can't remember shooting one in Boy Scouts. I never got there. Um, I wasn't an Eagle Scout like Mason, but uh, yeah, I never got to the, the the weapon. And you know, the interesting thing in in the Marine Corps, as you know, I had to wear corrective glasses because you go through a, a immense uh, medical study, you know, and review. And I never wore glasses as a kid. I played sports um baseball and stuff i just never wore it. but in the marine corps they said you need glasses and when i put them on i'm like oh i didn't even realize to see far away i didn't need glasses and the one thing is though it made me dizzy i don't know if i've been doing sports and stuff so i couldn't run in the marine corps with the glasses on and when i got to boot camp they didn't give me the option of wearing them sometimes or you know you know uh it was either you had to wear them or you didn't wear them at all there was no on and off and i made the conscious choice not knowing that you know I was going to have to qualify with the weapon or at least thinking ahead. I was thinking more about all the PT we we're doing saying, I can't wear these. So I put them away in the lockbox. I can never wear them. Well, that hit me hard when we went to the range and you're looking at 500 yard shots with iron sights. And I said, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I got a, I can't wear these glasses, but I got a pass. So I focus so hard on every fundamental, like I put my whole heart into it. And every instruction to the point where, you know, a lot of people were passing, but I'm sitting there Indian style, you know, in our sitting position with a pencil, holding it out, focusing on the front sight tip, right? Just getting my eyes to concentrate on the details of the front sight post, like while we weren't on the range. And, you know, I ended up, ended up winning a class high in my, in my boot camp. went on, shoot my first pistol and security forces, one class high there, mainly because I was able to focus on the fundamentals. Um, where it got a little more fascinating was when I went on to my my next uh, MOS, uh, Security Forces or Fast Company, and we had to do more CQB and more dynamic shooting. And I had an advantage there, but uh, I just expanded on it. So that was that was kind of my first time picking up a weapon. Wow. Yeah. Okay. L- late in life. All because you didn't want to wear some birth control goggles. Yeah. I'll fast forward. If anyone's on my Instagram, I already have my two-year-old uh, learn how to be target focused. So I cut out something I learned from Phil Strader and Ron Francisco, who you know have kids. As I cut out the A zone, and I already got them practicing shooting Nerf darts through the A zone. And I'm hoping by next year I'm going to get a swinger, and I'm going to teach them how to track the A zone with a Nerf gun. It's going to, I'm going to. He's not going to be like me, 18 years old, first time picking up a, a weapon. He's he's gonna be ten going to his first match and beating me and Leo. Yep. This <laughs> is why I love not a high guys, bar, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys seen those new link belts? Uh, uh, um, you can kind of piece them together like Legos. Double Alpha has them out. I'm not trying to put a plug oh, in there, but the cool, actually, the cool, yeah. J- uh, Jay Lee Williams, I think, was just demoing one. The cool thing about it is, I can get one for my my son at two. He'll never have to buy another belt. I just every year buy him an extra link. I mean, it's pretty cool. It's oh, one wow. belt for the rest of his life. Yeah, I just caught up. I'm like Link. I, 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 That's sorry. Yeah, it's, I, okay, it's like yeah, Legos. Yeah, yeah. It's brilliant. Gotcha, yeah, gotcha, brilliant. gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Or as I put on weight in the next ten years, you know. I, I mean, I that's what I was thinking belt. about. So <laughs> it's fine. Uh, so what? What led you to join the Marines? You know, I, I that, that's a tough one. You know, no, you're the first person in my career to ever ask me that, believe it or not, which is a common question. But, um, you know, I was big into teams, uh, sports, you know, and that camaraderie. I think that caught on. And I was also – I grew up playing guns as kids, you know, where you run around with, like, toy guns and stuff like that. So I kind of – I love G.I. Joe and all that stuff. Um, so – I think it was a breed between the two, just kind of having, I wasn't afraid to get muddy and dirty. Probably saw an ad on TV and it put a bug in my ear and say, Hey, I can have the same kind of camaraderie there. And I first wanted to fly planes, but I, because of my vision, um, I couldn't do that. So I went in the Marine Corps under the notion that I might be able to fly helicopters. Um, but they couldn't guarantee you that MOS um, at the time. Um, so I, I said, okay, you know, so that, and that, so I went infantry got security forces, but I had to also have shooting quals at a higher level for security forces. That also kind of inspired me to focus a little bit more on that aspect in my basic training. Um, But I think it was mainly because of the camaraderie. I've always loved being, having a close group of friends and, and, 
you know, that you can rely on and kind of go through life on. And I think that's extended in the USPSA. Now I have probably my best friends are in the shooting community. I mean, we talk every day on chat forums and stuff like that. Um, and, and they're jokesters. Um, and, and it's pretty cool. So I, I'd say that's why the camaraderie. Same thing with law enforcement um, and, and my agency because they're so connected to DOD. So I get it on both sides, the military and law enforcement. Uh, which we, we recently just saw, uh, which was amazing with Officer Gonzalez. We had the Joint Chiefs actually sent, you know, the vice chairman went uh, to New York for his funeral. Uh, you know, the military and, and the Pentagon really backed us and supported us. But then on the flip side, his brother was a, is an NYPD officer. Uh, the New York police came out strong for him. And, and seeing that camaraderie would give, should give anyone goosebumps uh, that we're a family and, and we're there. And well, that's pretty cool when you can extend your family to kind of to that magnitude and that range, you know, that's nice. Yeah. So did you go in open contract then nothing guaranteed for the Marine Corps? Yes. No, I had, I had fast company guaranteed with contingencies. I had to be a first class physical fitness test. Uh, and I had to be a first, uh, I had to be an expert, um, or, or uh, on pistol and rifle. I think actually just rifle for recruitment. Uh, but then I had past security forces. So, uh, which had pistol quals. So okay. I, I focused heavy on my uh, physical fitness and, and shooting. I just, I was glued to my instructors, you know, in boot camp. Now I, I'm going to ask this because I know how Dave feels about the, the, the firearm I'm going to ask why, you about. Why are you going here, Leo? <laughs> so did you have to, uh, what did you qualify for pistol on? Uh, the Beretta. Uh, okay. Yeah. I had the Beretta all through my career. I don't know if you can tell by Dave's reaction. He's not a fan. Not a fan. I'll be honest with you. I wasn't a fan either. Um, I, I had shot Glocks, um, and I knew there was a simpler platform. And I also, in the Marine Corps, you find out very quickly what stress can do to you. Um, and I like the simple operation of, of a pistol. Um, you know, I, I want to take human error out of any situation that could ever put my life in jeopardy, right? Or somebody else's. So I, I think anybody who has been in operations will appreciate simplicity uh, and reliability, right? And I've carried that over into my competitive career as well, because, like, as you guys know, one gun go down and on a stage, and that's your match. And when you yep. spend months on months preparing for a match at a high level, it's the last thing you want to happen, right? And uh, so, yeah, 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 definitely not a fan. So I guess it's just the Navy guys that like the Beretta. They also like their what? names on their ass, but that's a whole other yeah. story. <laughs> well, the, the Navy, the Navy had the Sig P two two, what two two six and eight. I mean, they, yeah. they they had a lot of Sigs deployed when I was over there, which was a double single or double action, only depending on what variant they had. But yeah, the DAC or whatever. Um, yeah, that that was a nice weapon. I I, I like that more than the Breda as well. Yeah, but, my brother I mean, did the two two nine DAC in the Coast Guard. Yep. So I'm not, I'm, there were things I liked about the Breda, but. I, I think there were some better choices in my in my time in the Marine Corps at the time. Yeah, I concur. Now you got out in two thousand four, but what year did you go in? Two thousand. Um, so okay. I was fully trained right when nine eleven happened. In fact, I was in Newport News, Virginia. We had just got done playing games. For those of you who have not been in the military, games is when your staff aren't just wants to put you in check. And our games were take everything out of our room set it up Whoa. in perfect size and alignment in the courtyard, clean your room, put everything back in your room. But before you do, you got to clean that to light white glove inspection. So we did that up until four in the morning. Uh, I forget why somebody did something. Um, I don't think it was me, but what I was <laughs> upset about when the way I found out nine 11 hit um, is we had our windows open. Cause it just smelled like fumes. Cause we had been cleaning all night. Right. Uh, we had helicopters land in our courtyard. That's what woke me up. And I was immediately pissed off because dirt flew into my windows and that is not an LZ. <laughs> so my first, yeah, you can imagine, right? Cause I was like, here we go. Games again. Right. <laughs> yep. So I didn't know why they were landing, but my first thing was, are you freaking kidding me? I got out of my rack. I got on the deck. I'm about ready to wring a, a pilot's neck. Second after that, once I calmed down, was why are there helos laying in our courtyard, which is not an LZ? I mean, it, it was an unmarked LZ, but not something we trained to, right? 
And next thing I knew, the third thing I looked at is my, as you can appreciate, my scout snipers, which we had attached to our teams, were running to the helicopters with their Alice packs. And now I'm like, you, you as a Marine don't need an order at that point. I started packing my Alice pack, waiting for my orders, right? You just, you fall in line. And, and what happened was we were deploying our scout snipers to New York because they were afraid of secondary attacks on the medical shelters. And uh, they deployed mm. to New York. They augmented our law enforcement there to pr protect the medical shelters for secondary attacks. And then about three days later, we went to the, to the med to start taking down ships that we thought Al-Qaeda refugees were hiding out on. And I did that for like a year straight on and off ship. Uh, we had the Navy SEAL, you know, would, would board these ships and then we would go on. They didn't have the, the masses to sweep these massive oil tankers. And the Marine Corps wasn't really big on CQB. They didn't have big teams on CQB. That's not how we were designed. So we were the first ones. We were the only ones capable of rapidly deploying with close quarter, close quarter tactics to take down naval ships of that size. Uh, so we would sweep the ships and we would port the ship and then investigators would come on and I would say, okay, you know, we're, we're flipping through the, the, the deck of cards. Like, who do we get? And we never found out. We just go on to the next mission. Right. And we didn't do that a lot. Some of them were protective operations too, to protect us ships in the med. Um, but then we came back to start training the larger fleet on close quarter tactics. Right. Uh, because that was the modern warfare that we were about to experience. So you can just like how I was trained in boot camp. You open a door, throw a grenade, and then go clear it. That was no more, right? You, you got to actually use tactics. Uh, you can't throw that grenade in there. Maybe a flashbang, but um, but even then, uh, those were limited. So I didn't want to do that. So I went in. I said, how, how can I get overseas? You know, this may be my last year. I may come back in as an officer, but – and protection was the only thing they were offering, and that's that's what I ended up taking. How long does it take to clear an, an oil tanker? Oh, all night. Uh, so, I can imagine. You know, to, yeah, it was it was pretty much all night. We would go in with about thirty initially, uh, secure key areas that the seals had already secured, but we would fortify them, uh, and then we go on with another thirty, so sixty marines. And I would say it would take about four or five hours to round everybody oh, up, zip wow. tie them, get them to a mass. I mean, and it's probably the worst environment to do cqb because the spaces are all there are no blueprints right like i can walk up to a house and say that's a corner entry just by knowing the house right somebody might have built a crazy room but on an oil tank you have no idea what you're about to walk into so every room is, is you have to use sound <laughs> tactics right so it, it, it just, you had to get, do it slow and methodical and it would take all night and you're doing it in, on, in the dark, right? There's a lot of oil tankers so aren't going to have all the lights on and you're not going to get those lights on. Probably the worst environment to do close quarter combat that you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, I've gotten lost on our naval ships being on deployment. I can only imagine an oil tanker. Good Lord. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we would get, we would get lost. Holy cow. So what was your uh, what was your MOS your primary MOS? So it was O three eleven, um, you know, infantry. But I, I never spent a day in the fleet, and that was in part why I got out. Um, I was uh, eighty one fifty two Security Forces Fast Company, which stands for Fleet Anti Terrorism Security Team, and we are the we are positioned all over the United States. And our job, there's a bunch of them nowadays, but primarily was to fortify embassies if they get overran. Uh, anywhere within 24 hours and sustain it if they you know choose to stay on the ground the second thing was to uh, secure any nuclear assets that should happen to come up so like the most famous one is uh the uss coal you know that was bombed in port our job was to go there and secure that and help the navy out right that's or a submarine if it should have to come up uh so you know basically we focus on logistics and close quarter combat and in sensitive environments as well um, so I never went to the fleet. Uh, most people, it's a two year billet. And then you go to the fleet usually as a corporal or something like that. I circled back in and then led a team as a corporal. And eventually I, I earned my Sergeant, uh, before I got out, but I was going back to the fleet as a Sergeant, as you can imagine, um, that was not going to be nice. Uh, there, I was going to have Lance corporals that knew more about infantry than I did. I, I hadn't done land nav for instance in four years. Right. So I just, I didn't want to set myself up for that. It just wasn't ideal. Right. And, 
Um, I, I knew I was going to have a, a, a hard time there. I could focus on my strengths, but that just wasn't going to be fair to the fleet as well. Um, so I was, my theory was get out, become an officer and go back in. And then I'd be, I'd be better, right? I'd even be stronger. I'd have both what we call a Mustang experience, uh, understanding the fleet, uh, and being able to lead at a, a, a an amazing opportunity, right? Um, just things kind of went sideways there a, a little bit. Um, but I'm still close uh, to, to the Department of Defense, as I repeated a couple times. Right. So you got out in 2004. How did you tr- how did you transition to the job you have now? Uh, it wasn't easy. I go into college. Um, you know, the work ethic that I had, I was like five classes. What do I do with the rest of my time? So I, I took a lot of classes and got through my degree. Uh, a little bit quicker, which my family appreciated too, because they were helping me out as well as the GI Bill. But, uh, you know, the Pentagon Force Protection Agency said, hey, you know, come here. Uh, it was a good center hub while I went through a couple other special agent um, announcements or job interviews, uh, which can take like a year, year and a half. And um, every time I thought about leaving my agency, they gave me another opportunity to grow. So I went from, you know, uniform division as a police officer to counterintelligence and Tiger Trap. That was a book that was given to me to read in the academy there. Uh, and then I went to the special agent side and really uh, leveraged my Marine Corps protection and uh, kind of just kept, kept doing that. And you know, every time I thought about, all right, I've kind of capped this position out. I, I may have to lateral to another agency to keep growing. Uh, my agency has given me another opportunity. And I really like my agency. Um, it's unique that we're civilian. My family loves it. There's very few jobs in the special agent community, like, you know, FBI, Secret Service, DEA, we're all the same MOS, I guess, for Marine Corps sake. We're called 1811s. It's a job series, right? Um, But I'm one of the few that don't have to move. You know, uh, most agents, like the military, you you deploy to different cities over your career, right? Mine's permanent in D.C., and my family's from here, and they don't want to move, and um, I'm not complaining. We have one, I think, Area 8 which is largely DC and Northern Virginia is one of the best shooting communities in the world. Cause I have my picks of matches every weekend. You know, I have two or three matches and I talk to some of my friends that are like, I have to travel two hours, one day a month, you know, for one match. And, you know, I, I have some aspirations actually to help USPSA. I know Cy was saying it's a volunteer sport and we need more people to help. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about running for area director, uh, and maybe higher up, I've been talking a lot with Matt Hopkins and people. And one of the things I want to do is, uh, you know, to kind of give a allude if I choose to run is help local clubs develop, uh, help more clubs, because I see what that means in area eight, where we have our selection of clubs or I can pick, meaning do I shoot this match this weekend, 45 minutes away, or do I shoot this one 30 minutes away? I, I see that's not the case everywhere else. And I think with an influx of USPSA growing, one, we need that. That That is the product, right? We shouldn't have 30-man squads. It's not a great experience for anyone. It's a big time commitment. Then you spend all day with your family, whereas I'm home by a late lunch, you know, from a match. Um, so I really want to – I think USPSA should be obligated to help young clubs come up more so. Not that they haven't done a good job. I just think uh, fresh blood in there to kind of pour lighter fluid on helping young clubs is something that I might be able to help out with. Okay. Oh, that's pretty cool. Now, where did you go to college and what g- degree did you get? So I went to Xavier University. Uh, we're a small little Jesuit school in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I went there because I had some friends that went there. And, um, you know, I, I, I played rugby with them. And it was a, a fun experience. And I got my degree in criminal justice. Okay. Catholics don't mess around with education, Dave. <laughs> no. Nope. And the Jesuits were the warriors of the Catholic Church. I'm just putting it out there. I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah, that basketball team puts as much time in ed- academics as they do into the basketball court. Um, you know, they, they have to live on campus. There are no fraternities. Um, they have, you know, tutors if, if they need it. I mean, it's amazing. It's a, I can, like you just said, they put more time into their education than they do actually basketball. And my, when I at least went there, uh, and that's saying something because they're, constantly in the big tournament and stuff like that so they are yeah i went to catholic school my whole life so i, I completely understand yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. i appreciate it coming out of the marine corps where you know my work ethic i was a little bit older and i was all about business at that point not necessarily 
uh, an experience per se, right. you know, which, which is great. I think kids should enjoy college and, and the experience and have fun because life only gets harder after that. Truth. For sure. Yeah. All right. So you got out in 2004, you went to college, you got your degree, then you started working for the DOD. The Pen Pentagon. And yeah. How and when did you stumble across the USPSA, your current addiction? So, yeah, it was probably my second year in uniform division, and we only got to train twice a year. And that training usually involved a qualification, and that was a higher standard than most law enforcement agencies, just so you know. Um, maybe not the Department of Defense, but law enforcement agencies, you know, some only get to shoot once a year. And I was like, what? Because coming from Fast Company, I, pretty much, I didn't even have to unbox ammo. It was just big ammo cans of free, loose ammo. It was to the point where your finger hurt. You could stop shooting, you know, like that was just an anomaly to me um, or, um, um, you know, weird to me or unusual that I, I can only shoot twice a year. And how am I going to stay proficient, you know, to the levels that I'm used to? So right at the same time, I had an uncle pass away and I didn't own a firearm other than my agency firearm at that time. You know, the Marine Corps, they gave us all the fun toys. Um, so I inherited a Remington 700 and you're going to appreciate this, Dave. I had a classic 700, probably from the 60s, maybe 50s or whatever. It was an original, never shot, still had wow. the packing grease on it, not rusted. And I said, what am I going to do with this? I'm not big into hunting at the time. It's my first gun that I own. Um, I inherited it. I said, you know, it'd be cool to build a Marine Corps sniper rifle. I was never on the sniper team. Even my our snipers, weren't. they didn't have M24s or I think that's what you used, right? M40. Um, yeah. M40s. We didn't have those. We actually had Mark, um, uh, what are the Mark 14s, right? Um, that were converted into designated marksman rifles, right? Right. So they the M14s, precision, yeah. Precision rifles with a scope, right? That's what they used because it was more from urban environment for our our needs, right? Um, so I, I, I was, I was just curious. I was like, I always thought, you know, Marine Corps snipers were amazing. It's our elite team of the Marine Corps, so it's kind of like rooting for your it is right <laughs> it's like rooting for your basketball team or football team if you go to ohio state right you, you root for them they're your tier tier one team they're, they're the creme de la creme mm -hmm. right so i was like it'd be cool to build what they had and i had quantico in my backyard so i'm like i can go shoot it there they got a thousand yard range i can still get on base so i was like i that was my opening to guns i was like all right what do i need a barrel i called up the guy who makes the uh schneider barrels and i'm like hey can i get a barrel he's like no I'm like, what do you mean? No, I'm a customer. He's like, well, I'm making a Marine Corps line right now. It'll be eight months. I'm like, eight months. I was wow. like, I'm not doing a deployment. I just want a barrel. <laughs> and that you, you're laughing because you know it's a whole nother culture, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I started talking to him. I'm like, I'm a Marine. I think he felt bad for me that I didn't know anything about this world that I was getting to. So he said, All right, if you can wait eight months, I'll build you one. And at the time, I'm like, thanks. But <laughs> That was a pretty cool thing that I didn't know. Yeah. About. Yeah. It's huge. And so it's <laughs> huge. horse in the mouth much. <laughs> I know. And later on I learned, I'm like, all right, this is all this guy does. He doesn't really do anything else. Like I'm like, okay, now I have like the Holy grail barrels. Right. Um, or one of them. Right. So I'm like, I need a stock. I called manners up for like six months. I'm like, what is going on here? I just want to buy this six months. I'm going to wait forever. Um, so, I, I had a lot of patients and then I had war rifles, which is a bunch of, uh, in Virginia, it's a small company, a bunch of, a lot of them are Marine Corps armors that, you know, kind of left and went there. And that's all they do is precision rifles. I had them build me the rifle. So I'm telling you this because I went to Quantico and I shot this thing and it was really cool. I had the Marines help me break it in. I knew nothing about breaking in a barrel. What? I was like, Oh yeah, you got to break this thing in. Um, so I had this, beautiful which i still have to this day which i have to shoot anymore because the ammo is so expensive to make but um i had this beautiful rifle and I'm like i just want to shoot a thousand yards i just think that's cool um and the marines helped me out they got me on target which i was telling you earlier dave i was like those rifles will shoot themselves you're, you're gonna shoot a quarter group if you have good fundamentals it's that's not what makes a sniper a sniper what makes a sniper is being able to get it on the first shot and I'm like, that is impossible. I, I still don't know how you guys do that. I mean, we're talking about wind. Uh, anybody that knows anything about the, the shooting community, there, there's so much to calculate. It's like a science project every shot. 
it's it witchcraft um, is what it is it, it's 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 a whole nother world right you can dedicate your life to it so i have a lot of appreciation for what you do dave but um so yeah so i tell you that because all of a sudden i heard a bunch of popping in the background of quantico and i said what's that you know or, or i figured it was like the marines training or something and i was just i was missing it i said oh it's a uspsa match and i said us to what <laughs> and they said you know it's a pistol match and i was like Oh, are they competing? Like, can I go watch? And they said, sure. So I get there and I'm like, it's a bunch of civilians. They're not even in the military. I'm like, yeah, it's open to the civilians. I'm like, I've been looking for this. I've been looking for this to augment my law enforcement training. So I, I said, what do I need? They said, you know, five mags, mag pouch, here are the divisions. I kind of read up a little bit. I bought a Glock 34, got five mags because I had a Glock for the agency. I said, that's the closest thing I can maybe be competitive with and also have the same training for my duty gun. Right. Um, I went to the match and I mean, the story was right. You guys know how that went, right? Yeah. Um, Mike, Mike here, 40 second stages. Uh, I'm just like, what, what is happening? I'm watching this 16 year old female phenom, like a, you know, Jay Lee's just blast it down. Two things happened there. One, I knew my standards in life were not, not even calibrated correctly. The military doesn't, you know, doesn't even understand this. Maybe tier one elements get that kind of training, but I didn't. And I was pretty close to that level, right? Uh, as far as training goes. Um, two, there are civilians out there that can shoot this level at this level that I may be asked to one day neutralize, right? I'm law enforcement to protect the community. And I said, I have to get to this level. I, I have to. It's not fair to the community. It's not fair to me or my family. To, to see this, know it, and not do something about it. So the story was written. I, I kind of I dug in, mainly from a skills standpoint, not competitive at the time. I didn't really aspire to be a national champion. And and then and then that's also how I met Dave Wampler. Um, that's a very interesting story. On my second, oh, well, my first match, I met Phil and Ron Francisco. Phil Strader and Ron Francisco. And I went up to them. I didn't know who they were but I noticed they shot very well and there was a Texas star. And I said, how do you shoot this? And they were so nice. They were like, Hey, here are a couple different options. Don't worry about it. If it starts to move, you know, it might be worth just leaving it. If you just have one plate, you know, the way time and scoring works. And they were awesome. And Ron ended up being my first instructor when I started taking it uh, seriously. Um, and it was great to get Ron the rocket. You should have him on the show sometime because he's got some classic footage. His wife's is a world champion. Um, and Phil's just a jokester. So he also, you know, it was great to meet him, and he's still a friend to this day. Um, but that's how I met Dave Wampler at my second match. And he asked me, how do I shoot this? I'm like, me? I'm just getting into this. Um, but I gave him my phone number, and his dad was my special agent in charge, the director, because I had to write my phone number on a business card. It's all the only piece of paper I had in my bag. And I, when he flipped it over, he said, Oh, do you know my dad, John Wampler? I was like, yeah, that's my director. And the story is written. Dave became my training partner for like three years. And Dave is what made me start thinking about it competitively. Because Dave came from the racing world of competitive racing, like with vehicles. And Dave, I came out from law enforcement. But when we were training together, I really, he inspired me, right? He pushed me into, well, what if you take it from a competitive angle? That's what I'm doing. And that was, that was written. Dave and I started traveling all over the country, uh, shooting together and, and learning as we went. We didn't really have a lot of national champions to really lean on other than Ron Francisco at the time, who's in our area, um, and, and Jerry Tetro, who is Mason's biggest mentor in the, in the shooting world. Um, and they're, you know, both law enforcement. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of became the start of it uh you know back in 2014 okay <clears throat> wow second that's funny yeah so it's crazy how the the community circles back into the rest of your life right for me uh, yeah absolutely it's funny you bring up ron because dave was saying that ron kind of pointed him the direction and we talked about this a little bit last night about using moving to open to increase his production abilities with a doc. Correct. So. Correct. I've, I've been talking a, a lot on that um, actually. So because the world shoots been pushed and like Jay Lee's and, and the Williams sisters said, you know, it's been pushed. So you got to recalibrate what you're going to do. And 
Uh, I talked to Ron about it. Ron initially didn't want me to switch because we thought it was going to just be pushed to like February or something like that early on. He said, Matt, you need to focus right now is not the time. And I did understand until now uh, how much there entails of setting up an open gun. I think that's what he didn't want me to be distracted by that. Um, and Ron knew I, my strength is movement. I focused a lot with Mason on that. So um, I, I don't think he wanted to, but Eric Rafael wanted me to. He said, no, this is the most complimenting two divisions is open and production. Open focuses on your speed of vision and movement um, and, and timing. And production will focus on your fundamentals. There's no way around it. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad bad day or bad year, right? And he said that's why he shoots the two back and forth. Uh, if anyone knows Eric Capel, you know, probably the GOAT in our Never time. Never heard of him. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, so I, I'm very, you know, that's the amazing thing about Eric, too. You know, he's up on this pedestal, but he has the time to talk to people like me. who I, I met him at Extreme Euro. Uh, and stuff like that, but he doesn't know me that well, and I don't know him that well, but he takes the time to talk to me when I ask him a serious question. He's the one that first put that out in one of a podcast that he was doing about open and production complimenting each other, but he didn't go into the details of why, and he really helped answer that for me. And now with World Shoot getting pushed, I have that opportunity, and CZ's been great helping me at least set up the open gun to save that time and give me you know years of, of test and trial and error. Uh, so Matt Hopkins and Caleb, um, you know, have really helped me out, get my open gun running in less than 30 days to a pretty competitive wow. level. Yeah. That yeah. There's, you know, there's, there's a lot to get going between optics, uh, how your hands fit on it, the tuning of the mags, getting the load dialed in and, you know, like candy lane, they gave me the shortcut. Uh, so I, you know, looking at it, I probably would not have done open because of how much time it takes to set up a gun if it wasn't for them too. Candyland, Matt's favorite <laughs> yeah. game. That's my favorite board game. In case, in case there you want to add your sixth question for openers. There you go. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. That's a good one. Yeah, but you can't ask yeah. like a Justine and Jalise Williams' favorite board game. I don't even think they know what a board game is because they're so young. You know what I mean? Like that's us no, old people. Do. Yeah. yeah. I didn't play board I games. Uh, once Dry Fire came out, about you know. <laughs> that is your game. Now. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, because we're in the same area, I can, I started shooting. I, I ran across USPSA totally by accident. I was like, wow, that was pretty good. I'm going to go try it. Um, and I remember I I've seen you around now for the three years, whether it's Fredericksburg, uh, I'm pretty sure I've seen you at Cavalier. Uh, I mm -hmm. know I've seen you up at Shadowhawk. But um, it seems like lately you've really increased your tempo. Is that by design? It is. Um, so I, you know, I have a two-year-old now, and um, at some point my training is going to be committed to him. So I asked my wife. I said, "Hey, I want to make one, maybe two runs at a world shoot and seeing what I can be the best." And that's. I mean, nationals are there, areas are there. I've, I've been very close a lot, but I, I said everything I've been doing has been for a world shoot to see what, how I stack up against the best in the world. And uh, like Mason says, you know, while the ultimate goal is to be the champion, what I really want to do is go there and be the best version of myself. I think winning, being the champion is right now. Um, it, you know, that's just the test. Um, once you go there, the story's written. All you have to do is focus on being the best version of yourself and the time that you put into it will determine whether or not you're the champion or not. Right. So I, I got a slot to go. I'm hoping it still stays true. Um, I'm actually happy that it got pushed because it just gives me more time to train. Um, but it's a big commitment away from my family. So my family has given me the time to train at a high level. Um, I kind of know what I need to do. I haven't been able to do it yet mainly because of ammo consumption now. Now I have the time. Now now it's ammo consumption. But um, I have not gone into a national championship fully prepped um, in the last three years yet because everything's been for world shoot. Um, and I want to peak at that point in time. So having it in April with only 50,000 rounds, you know, which is a lot, but not for world shoot. Uh, I was like, I, I can't use 10, 15,000 to get prepped for nationals. I have to save it for maybe this month September leading into world shoot. Right. Um, 
because that's when I want to peak. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, so I was really proud to finish, um, you know, you know, in, in, I, I forget what I finished, but like 20 or something like that. And I know I'm right there and I know it's just consistency um, that I lack. And I know that'll come once I ramp up. Uh, but may, I have a, had a lot of good mentors uh, that are very close friends really get me to that level. And I know they're excited to see where I can, what I can do. And they're professionals. So they get to train a little bit more than I do. So they're they're. But that's, you know, Mason Lane, Wants a Kim, Casey Reed are probably the three that I shoot with the most. Um, and then I have Ron Francisco and Dave Wampler here in the rear. And I got Phil Strader still there, um, you know, helping me probably the most with the mental game to always – don't forget to have fun while doing it and save your best for the test. Um, but yeah, and, and Jerry Tetro, who recently just moved, which was, I was kind of sad about, but I, I have all the, the, the tools around me and the time and the ability to go to the world shoot and represent, you know, the United States well, uh, whether I'm on a team or not. And I'm excited and I'm going to be able to travel with those friends that I just mentioned, right? Um which is only going to give me a strength. I see that as an asset because I'm going to have my mentors right beside me uh, on this long journey. You know, I think it's like what, four or five days shooting a world shoot. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I think next year I'm going to try and get a couple more international matches in to kind of give me that experience. There's a lot going on with that versus different time zones, you know, different languages, culture, just getting familiar with that. Uh, so I'll probably try and do extreme Euro. I know United States is out. I was signed up for like three or four IPSC matches here in the States from the handgun world shoot. The extreme was coming here. I think those are great matches for anyone looking to, to look at IPSC. Um, and I think, uh, I think you should try them out. They're usually bigger matches, like three or five day formats. So it's a bigger commitment, but uh, definitely maybe worth sacrificing a couple of smaller matches to, you know, if you, if it's a time thing for you to go do those. So it's a, it'll open your eyes, and then when you go overseas, you'll you'll kind of understand the IPSC format because there are some rule changes, right? Um, but yeah, so everything's been for world shoot, um, and, and that's what's clicked. And I know I only have maybe one or two world shoots to run before it's my son's time, you know, run around with the next gen, and and, uh, and then for me, I'll kind of digress and just have fun with it. So when you have that time constraint, you have goals, you know, the Marine it's Corps mentality time. is. It's crunch time. Go all yeah, in. And absolutely. that that's what sucks. The end thing sucks because I would be shooting more. Uh, but there are things you can focus on that I think are just as important. So I've been focusing a lot on strategy, movement, uh, and vision, which I don't need to shoot live. Um, you know, live is more of a timing thing um, and validating your training. But I kind of can – I can if you train and do dry fire as a part of your regiment, um, you can kind of learn. You know, if, you, if your dry fire is where it needs to be and if those are going to produce the results. Um, but, yeah, I, I hope ammo pricing comes down. It looks like it. It's, it looks like it's coming down a little bit. I knock on wood. Um, so that'll that'll help in the off season. What it may mean is I just don't take an off season. I just start, you know, getting back up to speed in, in the off season so I can hit spring full full steam ahead. Okay. So you're the first guest we've had that, didn't talk about, you know, being going to nationals and being a national champion. You're talking about the world shoot and comparing yourself yeah. to everybody in the world. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm sure there had to have been some things that you brought back from extreme Euro. You're like, I have got to practice these things in order to perform well at the world shoot. Yeah. hundred percent. The, the biggest thing coming out of extreme Euro for me was the mental game. It's a longer match. There's ups and downs. You're shooting 10 stages. Can you, so I've seen people and including myself, like I, it has taken me a whole stage to calm down, right? So I can show you data where I can say, hey, guess what stage I had a bad experience on and what stage I calmed down on. And you'll see, oh, you know, you, you went from, you know, winning the stage to 50th and then you were 50th again. 40th and then you went back up to winning the rest of the match right like you can see my mental and mason really saw that and i worked on that hard and probably the biggest compliment i got from mason is after extreme euro i had a couple of bad stages i had one where i threw four shots on a large popper at like 30 yards and it just crushed me because it was a it was a soft exit i wanted to leave so you're doing this back and forth yeah movement. Um, i hate that and the very next <laughs> yeah. stage 
I hate it, right? The yeah. very next stage, I responded and had I was right back to where I was. And I think Mason saw that and he said, Matt, you, that's the mentality you need if you want to you want to be a champion. And that's not easy when you're doing a stage like every 30 minutes versus every hour in USPSA. If you have a mental breakdown overseas in a national or in an international setting, you'll have five, six stages gone, like just demolished your core, right? Whereas in USPSA, it might just be one stage because you've, you've had two hours to recover mentally, right? So, like, yeah, like Jake Hetherington said, I, I kind of, I truly, if I, have a, if I have a bad experience, I've learned not to compound it, right? I don't make up time. Um, if, I, if, I, if I felt I threw a mic, in that stage, I can mentally start focusing on art. I need my points because I shoot production, right? And, and I, I may lose a second on that stage as well with that mic, but I'll have all alphas for the rest out. Um, and that helps me overcome that that mistake. I only had one mistake. So never compound mistakes in, if you want to be a champion. And you'll watch like a JJ or Mason. They'll have mistakes, but they're never going to have three mistakes on a stage, right? So the damage is absorbed in the aggregate, right? Um, not in that stage. So that's one thing. And then mentally, like Jake Hetherington says, I give myself maybe 30 seconds to reflect on it and be mad because we're human beings. Right. So, you know, but right after that, uh, I have cues that I've learned. I'll usually, you'll see me, I'll walk off the stage when I'm loading my mags. Um, and I'll look at the next stage and that helps me visualize focusing on what's ahead, not what's behind me. Uh, so you'll see me do that. If I have a bad stage, I'll just take all my mags, all my ammo, and I'll walk to the next stage and I'll set up on the next stage while I watch other shooters shoot and I, I don't even think about it. And then I, and I've learned through experience shooting a lot more majors in a season, like 15 to 16, lets you, lets you start to gain that experience to saying the match isn't going to be one on one stage. So coming, the biggest thing has been mental for me. And, and I could talk your whole show on, on some of the things that these great shooters have taught me uh, mentally. Um, some of the biggest actually is after a first day of being able to relax, not necessarily dig into the scores, right? Um, you know, just just have fun. You know, if you shot in the morning, the afternoon's not about prepping for day two. You know, if it's a three-day format, usually day two, we're starting to look to make adjustments. Uh, but that strategy is a mental game as well. Uh, and I've had a lot of professional shooters teach me, the, you know, that aspect um, to, to the aspects of the strategy that Eric Rafael plays on people. You know, we've been talking a lot about that on a world stage of you know, you're shooting now five days. How does how does Eric attack that strategy? And it's very fascinating because now it's a whole nother level. So, yeah, um, I realize I don't have the ammo, the time to shoot maybe as much as Mason or wants a Kim or Ben Stoker. Right. It's not a career for me. So how do I be the best version of myself? Well, I first had to ask, what's my goal? My goal is world shoot. Well, if nationals is in April. Why should I peak for nationals when my goal is world shoot, right? Mm -hmm. um, so once world shoot came in my head, nationals matters. It's a great test. There's not a greater pressure I can have on the States, right, to, to really put all my um, skills to test. So it does matter. Don't get me wrong. I go into it uh, just like I would a world shoot. But I realize that my skills might not be as refined as I would want them to be. And I accept that. I accept that, right? And my expectations – come down just a little bit to where I know I can be. And I don't get discouraged by it. Actually, I get motivated. I'm like, man, I look back at nationals last year and I was thrilled with how I placed because I, I had moments where I'm like, the time is the time that I'm putting in is really paying dividends. And I'm, I'm excited to see when I have a full workup where I can be. If that makes sense. Yeah. Now, when, when we, when we chatted before you mentioned something, um, about when to peak and for world yeah. shoot, you were saying, um, you were being told about September is when you want to peak. But my question yeah. for that is I always look at it as like a, a peak is a very, the very tip. So the yeah. only place to go is down from there. And if world shoots late November, beginning of December, are, are yeah. you, are you guys talking about peaking and plateauing? And then coming down after world shoot or how does that work? So there are a lot of factors there. Um, first is mentally not to get burnt out, right? You, you, everybody's unique and I can't give you a mapped out calendar. So this is where my mentors come into play, right? Um, 
you know, we, we talked, we just actually just spent the last month talking about this with Mason and, and Wants and Kim, you know, about how my strategy is going to set for this year. Right. Uh, so one's mentally, and that doesn't just involve shooting. Um, it could be your life, work, you know, what's going on at work, you know, is the quality really there in your training because you're burnt out at work, you know, or is it worth saving some of that time and, and being a little bit more rocks, you know, lowering your ammo quantity and things like that. Uh, so one's mental, um, two is ammo consumption, which just became a thing. Right. And that's why I was saying September was probably more that mark was more based on ammo consumption. Um, and then three is how much time do you have and, and what skills should you be focusing on? Right. I'm not going to, uh, so like right now I have a whole season, so why not shoot open and, and focus on my vision and movement and pick those skills up before I have to go back to production, right. And hone in on that weapon platform. Right. So for me, I, there's a lot that goes into it. And this world shoot will probably be different from my plan from last world shoot, right? Um, so for instance, I was going to take – last winter I took off time. That was for me mentally. It was for my family because they knew I was, I was going to have a ramp up and I was going to be taken away from my family. So we were going to go do things. We we're going to go to Disney World. We we're going to go travel. I was going to spend more time at home with them because I knew I was going to be taking away time from them as I get into those later months leading up to world shoot. Right. Um, the, the second thing was ammo consumption. I had enough ammo to do a pretty good workup leading up to world shoot, but not in the beginning. So I was ideally, I would probably want to do three times a week. It doesn't, ammo doesn't really matter. I just take, I just want to take ammo to the range and not have to worry about it. Like based on my, all right, today I only got 30, 40 minutes because it was hot and I'm tired. All right, go home. I shot 300 rounds. It doesn't matter to me. It's about, how long I can focus the quality of my training, right? There are times where I can spend three hours at the range with Dave Wampler because we're going back and forth and we're shooting a ton of rounds because we're working on something with a high, high round consumption, like doubles or something, you know, um, which is a drill um, that wants to put out. So it doesn't, I don't like to put an ammo quantity on it. It's more about my time. And usually I get burnt out after an hour, to be honest with you. If I'm going past that, it's, it's usually not as productive. I'm doing it because maybe I don't have time later in the week because it's about to rain for the next four days. It's not really as productive, but I'm going to accept it. Um, but usually I'm right around five to 600 rounds. Well, I knew I was going to have to break that down to two to 300 rounds. So my theory last year was instead of three times a week, I'm going to go maybe four or five times a week and go 100 to 200 rounds and, and break it down just to up my frequency, right? And from that, I'm going to get out of it is I'm going to be more effective on demand. I'm going to build my, my cold starts, you know, the first two stages. I'm going to come out very strong. I'm going to take that as an advantage. So I'm kind of always thinking the glass is half full in my training, right? Not going to let ammo consumption distract me. Um, now I think I can get back up to the ammo supply I want. So now I'm probably going to go back to a three day format. I'm probably not going to take an off season. I'm going to switch to production in my off season because I'm coming from open. So I'm going to use my off season to switch to production. And if world shoots in the fall, um, you know, I'll, I'll probably start working up uh, to longer sessions, shoot a lot more majors. I'm going to shoot a lot more IPSC matches next year. I, I might have to sacrifice some area matches and some local matches uh, to do that. Um, and to just make sure I have the train time. But all that could change because of work. So I got to stay flexible. But, yeah, there, there's a lot in the ramping up. But I would say the month out um, – I would say probably the, I would say September, I like to ramp up because I also don't want my hands to get burnt out. Uh, my muscles will start getting tight. And if anyone's worked up to that level, they'll know your, your body will actually start being come, become counterproductive, even your vision. Um, so I want to take like a week or two off before I will shoot, where maybe I just shoot a little bit, just dry for a little bit, but I let my body recover. Um, and that's my arms, my hands. I can usually feel that in the off season to spring where I pick up the gun and I'm like, wow, my, my muscles are relaxed. I, I can, I'm faster. I'm, I have a better indexing. So I want to, I want to do that before world shoot as well. I want to have time to take off. So that's why I said world shoots in November, September, I want to peak because in October I'm going to start taking some time off to relax, you know, and maybe just getting the mental game right and just start visioning a great performance at world shoot and then getting, you know, all the logistics ready, get my family there make sure they're happy and then, you know, coordinate with my friends when they're going to arrive and not have to worry about training at them. Does that make sense? 
A- absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of kind of like a pre-deployment, right, for the Marine Corps. Right. You got to get in the right mindset. Until next time. Don't be a little bitch. Yeah. Mm-hmm.